This is American Freedom News with Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect newscast in America, reporting global and national news too hot for television, standing up for faith, family, and freedom, defending our Constitution and patriotic heritage, exposing corruption, and tracking the latest global developments. American Freedom News, the radio program on the cutting edge of today's news. And now, live from his studio in Texas, here's the founder and president of American Freedom News. Rick Wiles. We've got a real mess in this election. This thing is getting nasty, it's getting messy, and it is moving quickly to a constitutional crisis. This is what's happening today. This is 12 noon on Wednesday afternoon, and in the state of Florida, in Miami Dade County, you've got uh, almost a riot situation at the courthouse. Uh, the Democrats have locked themselves into a room. They're not allowing anybody in to watch them count the votes. They've changed the terms again. The rules have been changed for a third time. Now the Democrats are only going to count the ballots that were kicked out by the voting machine. Republicans are out on the outside beating on the door, shouting to let them in. The cops are there. Uh, this thing is getting ready to break out into fist fights. This has happened after the Supreme Court of Florida uh, last night made that uh, Democratic Party ruling, uh, allowing the Democrats to continue counting the votes until Al Gore can steal the election. Meanwhile, another uh, chaotic thing breaks out uh, this morning with Dick Cheney suffering heart pains and being hospitalized in 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 a hospital in Washington. On top of this... There is a lawsuit in the state of Texas that is challenging Dick Cheney's residency in Wyoming. What in the world is going on? Well, I'm going to talk about it on today's program. I've I've been trying to avoid devoting a lot of time on this program to the election because uh, you're getting this news from every other direction, every other radio and television program. Uh, But my friends, this thing truly is turning into a constitutional crisis and I maintain that this, there is a reason to be concerned that this crisis is engineered. And I'm not saying that George Bush and Al Gore are doing it. I think they may be, uh, they may be puppets in this in this game, and they don't even know who's pulling the strings on this mess. But I'm going to talk about it later in today's program. Let me give you the quick uh, headlines about what is happening right now. As I said, Dick Cheney hospitalized today with chest and shoulder pains. Uh, Reports coming out of Washington say that he is resting, that he's calm uh, after a series of tests. Cheney is 59 years old. Uh, He was at home in McLean. Well, it says he was at his home in McLean, Virginia. How many homes does this guy have? Uh, He's got a home in McLean, Virginia. He's got a home in Dallas, Texas, in Highland Park, and he's got a home in Wyoming. So as he was at his home in McLean, Virginia, for the Thanksgiving holiday, he was admitted to the George Washington Hospital in Washington, D.C. Now, Cheney has suffered three heart attacks previously. He also had a quadruple bypass in 1988. When he was asked about his health during the campaign, he pointed out that he had gone on to serve as Secretary of Defense during the Gulf War and has had no medical problems. Now, Cheney's hospitalization followed the ruling by the Supreme Court last night in the state of Florida, giving Al Gore more time to keep counting the votes. Cheney resigned as chairman of Halliburton Company, a Dallas-based oil services firm, after being selected as Bush's running mate. He was chief of staff during Gerald Ford's uh, term in office. He was also defense secretary during... President George Bush's term. Now, here's the situation on his residency. We had a lawsuit filed here in, in uh, Dallas, and uh, which was uh, challenging Cheney's residency in Wyoming. Now, Cheney has a Texas driver's license, but he changed his voter registration to Teton, Teton County, uh, Wyoming, on July 21st which was four days become, before becoming Bush's running mate. And I think it was the day before the deadline in Wyoming for voter registration. 
Well, the the people who filed the lawsuit in Texas claim that that uh, uh, Dick Cheney is not a Wyoming resident. He is therefore a Texas resident, and therefore, because of the Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, he cannot serve as vice president under George Bush because both men are from the state of Texas. The Constitution bars the president and the vice president from being from 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 being elected from the same state. Now, yesterday, a judge rejected the lawsuit that would bar Texas's 32 electoral votes from going to Republican George Bush. Attorney Bill uh, Berenson of Fort Worth said Tuesday's ruling by U.S. District Judge Sidney Fitzwater will be appealed to the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. That's according to the Dallas Morning News. The lawsuit is based on the 12th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which forbids a state's presidential electors from voting for both a presidential and vice presidential candidate from the same state. Now, shortly before the selection, this is a, a UPI article, shortly before the selection by Bush, Cheney, who had lived in Dallas for five years, traveled to Wyoming and changed his voter registration and driver's license to that state. Cheney has recently placed his Dallas home up for sale. I think it's solicited at $3.1 million. Now, Cheney was a former Wyoming congressman, still owns a vacation home in the state, and he's, and he's using the vacation home as his residency. Mr. Berenson said Cheney still owns a home in Dallas, has a Texas driver's license, and has listed himself as a Texas resident on income tax returns. He also pointed out that Cheney worked uh, as a CEO of uh, Halliburton uh, Company in Dallas. Berenson said Wyoming law requires that those who seek residency must not claim residence in another state for at least one year. So this thing is turning into a huge constitutional crisis. We've got Florida's 25 electoral votes uh, in dispute. Now there are serious questions being raised about Cheney's residency. Plus, on top of all this, Cheney himself uh, is suffering heart pains and is in the hospital today. The man has had a quadruple bypass and three heart attacks in the past. This is not going to do the country's nerves very well. Now, you get this mess happening this morning in Miami, in Dade County. You've got this uh, mob scene at the courthouse as angry Republicans and Bush supporters are beating on the doors. Literally, this is what the reports are saying. They're beating on the doors, yelling uh, for the Democrats to open up the doors and let people in. The Democrats will not even allow the news media inside the courthouse rooms uh, in the voter election uh, offices to watch the counting of the votes, it, folks, this is this is going this is as dirty as anything I have ever witnessed in my lifetime, and I I thought I've seen some dirty politics played in my lifetime, but this is really down and dirty, and Gore is stealing this election. This literally is becoming a coup d'état. Gore is going to steal this election. He's going to do whatever he's got to do to get the votes. And, and and they're going to any extreme right now. Uh, the latest thing this morning is, and this is from the Miami, the Miami Herald newspaper, says Miami-Dade election officials facing a new deadline. But they said they could not meet, voted unanimously, unanimously to only hand count 10,000 ballots that had been called into question. Miami-Dade had been on track to complete a hand recount of 654,000 presidential ballots. The Florida Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision last night, ruled that the manual recounts can continue, but only until Sunday. The court said the new vote totals must be included in state tallies. Miami-Dade's decision to count only the so-called undervotes, or ballots that didn't record any pick for president in a machine count, immediately drew sharp criticism from the Republicans. Now, when they're talking about undercounts or undervotes, now, this is what they're talking about. The, the ballots, there are basically 10,000 ballots that, that don't have any votes at all for president. And, and the Democrats are saying, hey, this is, um, this is suspicious. This is, uh, this is not right. 
there can be 10,000 people who didn't vote for president. Well, yeah, sure, sure there could be. There could be 10,000 people who couldn't stomach voting for either one of them. And they skipped the presidential election. But the Democrats are saying that can't be right. Why wouldn't 10,000 people want to vote for Al Gore? Of course those people wanted to vote for Al Gore, but there, there's got to be some explanation for why they didn't. And so they're putting these ballots under microscopes looking for the slightest pinprick into the into the, the Gore name to indicate that the voter was thinking about voting for Al Gore. I mean, this is this is getting to be like Johnny Carson's great Karnak, where they're holding the ballot up to their forehead and saying, yes, this person wanted to vote for Al Gore. There's another vote for Gore. And so now they're only going to count these 10,000 ballots in order to meet the deadline for Sunday night that's been imposed by the Supreme Court. So they're going to take the they're going to take the machine count vote from from 2 weeks ago and then add in all of the votes that they can they can squeeze and push through for Gore out of these 10,000 disputed votes. They're going to take as many of those votes and add it to the machine count vote and hopefully they'll come up with a couple hundred votes for Gore. I mean, we're talking 10,000 ballots. And and all they got to do right now Gore, I mean, Bush is only ahead by like eight or 900 votes. So you, you only have to do this in a couple counties to come up with 1,000 votes, and that's what they're going to do. They're going to squeeze out 500 to 1,000 votes for Al Gore. And they got the doors locked. Nobody can even watch them, what they're doing. It is absolutely illegal. It is, it, it is the most corrupt thing I have witnessed in my, in my life. Um, Miami-Dade says uh, protesters also claim they saw someone hand a ballot to Joseph Geller, chairman of the Miami-Dade Democratic Party. When Geller got into an elevator, protesters followed him uh, into the elevator and down to the first floor, and, and they shouted for the police to come, and the, sh- the protesters were shouting, thief, thief, all right, because they saw him walk out of the, uh, of the uh, election office with a ballot in his hand and get in the elevator. Listen, they've had they've had they've had cases of Democratic uh, supervisors scoop the chad up off of the the table, the little round cardboard pieces of paper punched out of the ballots, and there shouldn't be any of those. I mean, if how could you get these uh, little pieces of cardboard uh, laying on tables and on the floor if if all the votes have already been voted for? Somebody's punching them out. And uh, they've they've had witnesses of of Democratic officials literally scooping up the Chad in their hands and putting them in their mouths and swallowing the Chad. This is the kind of corruption that's going on. I, you know, for me, it's not hard to envision what's going on because I've been involved in politics. I've run for office back when I lived in Maryland, and and Maryland was an extremely corrupt state. Uh, when I ran in 1994 against the Maryland. Uh, ma- uh, majority leader of the House of Delegates on election night, I was losing by 10 votes. It was the closest election in the state of Maryland in 1994. My opponent was the second man in charge of the state legislature in the House of Delegates. He was thought to be unbeatable, and and I gave him the scare of his life. Matter of fact, the next election, four years later, he was defeated by another candidate. But that night, I was losing by 10 votes. And and I saw some really weird, funny things go on. There's no doubt in my mind uh, how they beat me. They beat me with the with the absentee ballots. Now Maryland law says that you have to you have to count the absentee ballots in the presence of witnesses. In the next day after the election, I went to the courthouse immediately. Now again, I'm 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 trailing by ten votes. I mean this this made this made newspaper stories all over the state of Maryland. And uh, I went to the courthouse, and I asked them, when are you going to count the absentee ballots? No one would give me a straight answer. And when I finally got fed up with it, and I said, look, state law says you have to do this in the presence of witnesses, and I can be a witness. And then they finally uh, said, well, we're going to do it tonight at, 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 at 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. or whatever time it was. I also asked them to show me where the ballots were, were being stored. And an election clerk pointed across the room to a safe. This was a big, tall wall safe. 
and said, over there. And I said, you mean that safe with the door hanging open? And, and she said, yes. And I said, those are the ballots right there in front of everybody? And she goes, yeah. And I said, why is the door open? And she said, because we're, we're coming and we're taking the ballots and do, you know, we're going here and back and forth with the ballots. And I said, wait a minute, why are you moving? Why are you moving absentee ballots? Well, she couldn't give me an answer. And so I called the sheriff. And I, I demanded that the sheriff bring an armed deputy down to the courthouse and stand guard over the, the safe that had the absentee ballots and lock it up. And that made, I mean, I'm telling you, I made some enemies in my hometown when I did that because they knew I wasn't going to play games here with them. But here's what happened. That night, when we all gathered for, for the counting of the absentee ballots, what happened was, and I, and I was so exhausted, I had been working so hard and campaigning with very little sleep that I was you know, I was about ready to pass out that evening. And, and of course, there were a lot of people there to watch the, the counting of the ballots. What happened was they were opening up the ballots out of the envelopes, counting them. But what I didn't realize until later, until that night after I went home, it dawned on me what I had just witnessed the the ballots in Maryland were mailed in two envelopes. There was the the voter uh, put the um, uh, the ballot in an inner envelope, and then the inner envelope was put in an outer envelope, and the and the voters signed the outer envelope. So the outer envelope that they brought the ballot had both the signature of the voter and the postmark, which would verify that it was a legal absentee ballot. Well, what I realized after the voting was done was that they had already taken the ballots out of the outer envelopes. They, all we were watching them do was open up the inner envelopes, and I should have protested it. I should have contested it. But again, because I was so burned out and so tired, I, you know, my mind wasn't as sharp at that time. Well, all of the votes in, in that county's election, in my home county, all of the absentee ballots went overwhelmingly Republican. Every Republican candidate got the vast majority of the votes, and I'm talking maybe uh, 70% of the absentee ballots were Republican. There was only one race that it went the other way, and that was my race against the Democratic Party leader. It was the only race in our county where the absentee ballots went Democrat, which was very suspicious and a lot of people were looking around and wondering, man, that, that does not make sense. Well, the next day after the, uh, this is now two days after the election, my son Jeremy and I did our own little vote uh, investigation. And I went to the courthouse and I obtained a list of absentee ballot um, voters. Uh, and, I, and I photocopied their uh, signatures. And what I looked for and I, I zeroed in on nursing homes. I'm just giving you a little insight of how election fraud is, how it happens every election. So I, I had in my district, in the legislative district that I ran in, uh, there were probably, um, I'm guessing, uh, seven or eight nursing homes. And and so I I looked for the addresses of absentee voters that had the nursing home addresses. And then, then I knew, okay, these votes came from residents inside nursing homes. I then went to the nursing homes, and I obtained permission from the nursing home administrators to go to the, to the, uh, uh, the various rooms in each of the nursing homes and meet the patients. Well, the very first, the very first room that I went into was an elderly lady in a, in a wheelchair, and she was, obviously, the moment I went in, I knew she was blind. And she was a very nice lady. And I asked her, I said, how did you vote? And she said, oh, yes, I voted. And I said, may I ask you how you voted? And she said, oh, there's a wonderful nurse here in the nursing home. And she fills out the ballots for all of us. Isn't she just wonderful? And I said, yes, bless her heart. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. And I looked at my son, Jeremy, and I said, okay, let's go to the next room. The next nursing home room, uh, the dear old lady, uh, I would say she was probably in her 90s, uh, was an invalid. She was, she was uh, 
laying in a bed. She couldn't lift her head up. Her her head was like laying down on her on her chest. She had slobbers running down her face. Uh, she was a you know a stroke victim. Couldn't move. Uh, I I asked her uh, her name and she she made some grunting sounds. Um, you know, it was obvious she was incoherent. And yet I was standing there by her bed, holding a an a Maryland absentee ballot uh, card with her signature on it. Now there was no no way this woman signed that ballot. There was no way she couldn't even lift her eyelids to look at me, let alone pick up a pen and sign a ballot and fill out a ballot. So who who did it? And and so we went we went from room to room in the nursing home and we went to multiple nursing homes and the story was the same. In each nursing home there was a nurse who filled out all of the ballots for the the patients of the nursing homes. Well folks, that added up into hundreds of votes and and I was losing by 10 votes. So it I want you to see, this is the way the Democrats play. They're dirty, they're crooked, they're dishonest, and they, they do this all over the country. And that's just one example of what's going on. Now, the anger is starting to really build up. People are, you know, I, I, can, I can start to, I told you last week, I said, if this thing drags on another week, patience is going to run out among people. Uh, people are going to start getting angry. Their uh, nerves are going to get frayed. And uh, if if Gore really persists in stealing this election, he's going to drive the country to the to the sharpest division that we've had since the Civil War. And already I, c- I can see by just listening to comments on other radio programs uh, by uh, guests and hosts that people are are really becoming outraged. Last night, William Bennett, uh, former Secretary of Education, said, uh, "quote uh, This is what he said on CNN." He said. This may be the worst thing I've ever seen. Al Gore's trying to steal this election. Rush Limbaugh said yesterday that, that Gore is suffering from, quote, an unquenchable thirst for power. A Christian radio talk show host, Janet Parshall, uh, said, quote, uh, there's, a, there's a movie opening this week called The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. And, and she said uh, she's starting to wonder now whether Gore is the Grinch who's stealing the White House. Now, when I come back, I'm going to tell you some of the other things that are developing in this election and how this is moving to a constitutional crisis. We're in trouble, folks. I'll be back in one minute. American Freedom News is your alternative source for news. Your alternative news source. We investigate the news the television networks are afraid to report. Keep tuned to this station. Rick will be back with more global news. Chinese PLA officers on American military bases. Russian submarines patrolling America's coastlines. Radical Muslim secret training camps inside the USA. A UN army, global government, and world religion. West Nile virus, bubonic plague, and bioterrorism. Illegal immigration, the rising European superstate. And plans to replace the American dollar with a common currency. News the left wing media refuses to report. What else is happening the news media doesn't tell you? Listen to the program that's on the cutting edge of news American Freedom News. Finally, there's another news network reporting news too hot for TV American Freedom News. The first internet radio news network standing up for faith, family, and freedom. American Freedom News, the People's News Network. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the citizen reporter on the cutting edge of today's news. And now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. Republican uh, Congress member Lincoln Diaz Ballard. Uh, whose district includes part of Miami-Dade, said, quote, this is something, if it were not so tragic, if we were not witnessing, in effect, the stealing of the presidential election, it would be laughable. But nobody's laughing about it today. Uh, Folks are beginning to realize that this is exactly what's going on, the stealing 
of the election. And as I said on yesterday's program, I don't know why anybody would be surprised that uh, the Clinton-Gore gang would do this. We've had eight years of corruption. We've had eight years of murder, stealing, lying, uh, treason. What else have these people done? They they learned in... Um, I'll tell you what, when they... When they got off the hook, when Clinton got off the hook on the impeachment over the Monica Lewinsky affair, when he got off the hook on that one, he got the green light. What what that told him was, I can do anything. I can't be stopped. I just beat an impeachment rap, and I'm invincible. And And the American people gave Clinton and Gore the green light to lie, steal, cheat, do whatever they've got to do to hold on to power. And we've got a criminal gang in the White House. Now, this thing is like a mafia. It is a criminal gang. I've said this on this program constantly, that we're being run by an international crime syndicate. And these people are ruthless, and I believe they're violent. They'll do anything they've got to do to hold on to power. And Al Gore is stealing this election. It's happening right in front of our eyes. This is history in the making. This is modern day vote stealing, and it and it, and and I think we're about to see the real Clinton Gore administration be brought out in front of our eyes. I think they're about to put the hammer down on people who oppose them, because uh, as the Wall Street Journal said in their editorial, that we have a coup d'état taking place. These are strong words coming out of a. A newspaper like the Washington, like the New, or excuse me, the Wall Street Journal, calling it a coup d'état, and that's but it's exactly what's going on. Uh, the military votes, it, it does not look good that the military votes are going to be are going to be counted. Uh, uh, we've got some uh, military guys who are filing lawsuits claiming uh, that they were denied the opportunity to vote. A lot of a lot of military guys stationed in Florida, and a lot of military guys use Florida and Texas as their their address because uh, no state income tax in, in Texas and Florida. There are reports that the day before election, a lot of troops were told, a lot of troops stationed in Florida were told to pack up and get on ships that they had to go immediately into various exercises. And those those troops were not given the time to vote. It was already after the the deadline to apply for an absentee ballot. It's the day before the election. And so only God knows how many how many military men were prevented from voting. And only the commander in chief, William Jefferson Clinton, could engineer that kind of shenanigan to uh surprise the Navy with with the uh, last minute orders to pack up and ship out the day before the election. So what we, what you and I don't know is how long Clinton and Gore have schemed and plotted, and they've got this long, long list of dirty tricks that they did. Because if they could, if they could cheat, steal, and lie their way with a couple million extra votes, they know that that's all it takes to swing the election. And they they had a long list of dirty tricks that they pulled, just like handing out the free cigarettes to the homeless people and getting them to fill out absentee ballots for a pack of cigarettes. It's illegal. They should have went to jail for it. But this stuff was going on all over the country. But uh, the Republicans are giving up uh, any hope that those absentee ballots from the military are going to be counted. Washington Times says today, hope faded for Republicans that Florida officials would reconsider disqualified overseas absentee ballots as counties shrugged off the state attorney general's advice for a recount. Now, the state attorney general is a Democrat. And and that's what, you know, I I think the attorney general realized, hey, I want to get reelected myself, and I am not going to take away the votes of the military in this state. And so he came out with a ruling on Monday saying that, uh, hey, listen, you know, We can go ahead and count those absentee ballots from the military. But the Democrats in the county election offices are not even paying attention to a ruling from the state attorney general. See, the Democrats don't care what the laws are. They don't care as long as they get more votes for Gore. 
They'll cheat, lie, and steal. They don't care what the laws are. They don't care what the rules are. This thing is about winning the election for Al Gore. Now, there is another scenario that could take place in Florida. I mentioned this yesterday, but state law allows the legislature of Florida to select the electors. And the Constitution of the United States gives that responsibility to each state. Washington Times says today Florida's legislators said yesterday they are considering using a federal law that would let them name the state's 25 electors if the presidential election stalemate is not resolved before the December 12th deadline to certify them. The Republican-controlled legislature was sworn in yesterday in the midst of the legal and political turmoil that has gripped the state since November 7th. Republican leaders are studying a 1948 federal statute that permits them to appoint a slate of electors if one of them has not been chosen through the normal election process. The article quotes Senator Locke Burt, member of the Florida State Judiciary Committee, saying what is under consideration is calling a special session, appointing a set of electors prior to December 12th. Senator Locke said Republican lawmakers were concerned that if the dispute over the one over who won the popular vote is not settled soon and no electors are chosen by the ballot uh, by the deadline to cast their vote in the electoral college, quote, it will result in disfranchising six million people in Florida who did vote. Well, the question is, what are the Democrats going to do if the legislature under Governor Jeb Bush just goes ahead and, and uh, uh, says, hey, the, the Florida election results have been tainted, and uh, we're going to go with the ruling of the, of the state secretary of state, Kathleen Harris, and we're going to certify those votes that George Bush won the election. So the question is, what are the Democrats going to do at that point? Obviously, they're going to, they're going to scream bloody murder. They're, they're going to go to, to the U.S. Supreme Court. And we're going down to the wire on choosing the next president. I told you the other day that Clinton has locked Bush out of the transition office. New York Post says today, while lawyers in Florida joust over dimples and chads, the transition clock is ticking towards zero hour. With jobs to fill, Congress to court, and foreign leaders to impress The presidential ballot recount is cutting into crucial time needed to organize a new administration. They quote Alvin Felsenberg, a fellow at the Heritage Foundation, as saying it's having an impact. It's delaying the announcement of of appointments and background checks to say nothing about Congress and confirmation hearings. Felsenberg is an expert in transition logistics. And he says that his organization has received inquiries from both political camps. Among the typical items on a transition agenda, he said, are the inaugural address, a new budget, and a list of legislative proposals. So how's Wall Street responding to all this? Well, just before walking into the studio, I looked at the stock market to see what was happening. Bloomberg News reporting today, U.S. stocks are falling This morning, going up to noontime, Bloomberg says U.S. stocks fell after Florida's Supreme Court said hand-counted ballots from three predominantly Democratic counties must be added to the state's total, delaying a resolution of the presidential election. Uh, The court ruling may improve Al Gore's chances of winning the race, and uh, investors are starting to get a little nervous now about a President Al Gore. Uh, They quote uh, one Bear Stearns and Company chief investment strategist, Liz McKay, is saying, quote, investors are disturbed by the lack of a resolution. It's playing into a sense of instability because you've got an economy that's in transition to something slower. Also, T-bills have been rising. And whenever you see T-bills rising, that's, uh, that's a sign that investors believe that the economy is going into a recession. They start pulling their money out of, uh, out of stocks and putting it into a safer T-bill investment. 
And that's been happening all this week, Monday, Tuesday, and now today. U.S. Treasuries rose for a third day, says Bloomberg this morning, bolstered by a Florida court ruling that's helping Al Gore win the presidency. But the big story is this. What if what if Dick Cheney, God forbid, what if the man, uh, his health deteriorates uh, to the point that either the man passes away from a heart attack or, or he simply says, my doctors have told me the stress of this election uh, is going to kill me. I can't go on. Uh, I need to resign. I need to make way for another vice presidential candidate. Or on top of this, uh, he's he is dragged into court to prove that he is a Wyoming resident. And what if a federal court, a federal uh, court somewhere, uh, rules that that Cheney is not a Wyoming resident; that he is in fact in fact a Texas resident, and therefore he's barred by the Constitution of the United States from serving with Bush. What happens in the next uh, few weeks prior to the December 18th? meeting of the Electoral College. What happens then if Cheney is taken out of this election? How's he replaced? Well, I, I did some quick research on this. And if if a vice presidential candidate must be replaced, uh, the presidential candidate chooses a successor who must be ratified by his party before the December 18th meeting of the Electoral College. If it becomes necessary to replace Cheney as Bush's running mate, Bush would choose the successor on the ticket. Then the Republican National Committee would gather to ratify his choice. Because he's not president or president-elect, it is the prerogative of the party to approve a replacement. Now, Because the Electoral College has not met yet, Bush and Cheney are still only presidential candidates. Not until after the electors act on December 18th would either Bush or Al Gore become president-elect, which would require adherence to the 25th Amendment in the case of death. Now, if a vice president or a vice president-elect dies after the electoral, electoral college uh, electors choose that person, then the 25th Amendment kicks in. And it requires that a president or president-elect must nominate a new vice president who must be confirmed by both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. So right now, as the way it stands, if Cheney has to back out, he's got to do it before the December 18th meeting of the Electoral College. So the question is, Who's waiting in the wings? Is it Colin Powell? Is it General Colin Powell who is standing back, ready to be tapped uh, by the globalists to take this position? Folks, I threw out to you the other day a really wild scenario, but I'm not so sure it's not that, it, that it's not that crazy. And that is this, that we're going to see a deadlocked electoral college. We're going to have an election crisis. Neither Gore or Bush are going to win a majority of the electoral votes. And the Electoral College is either going to choose another president and vice president, or they're going to throw it to the U.S. Congress. And now you've got a U.S. Congress that is split down the middle. By the way, the recount in the state of Washington, Republican uh, Slade uh, Gordon was winning by a few uh, hundreds of votes or a thousand votes. He is now trailing, I think, by 1,900 votes. If Gordon loses his uh, U.S. Senate seat as a Republican, if he loses that Senate seat, the U.S. Senate will be divided 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. And the vice president cast the tie vote, the tie-breaking vote. Who is the vice president? Al Gore. So you'd have Al Gore uh, casting the the final vote, the tie-breaking vote on who becomes president. This this thing is getting bizarre. And this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my lifetime in the choosing of a president and a vice president. But I, I said, I think it was on Monday's program, 
I am not convinced right now that we are not going to see a new president and vice presidential candidate arise before January 20th. And if I had to put money on it, my choice, my guess, my hunch of who the Congress or the Electoral College would pick as the consensus candidate for president and vice president would be Democrat U.S. Senator Jay Rockefeller of West Virginia and Republican Colin Powell. And we would be told by the news media that this is the only solution to a divided nation on the verge of civil war over this election. I'll be back in a minute with more news on American Freedom News. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the citizen reporter on the cutting edge of today's news. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the people's news reporter. History was made on today's date. Stay tuned for an American Minute with Bill Federer. Shouts rang out as President John F. Kennedy was assassinated this day, November 22, 1963, in Dallas, Texas. He was on his way to deliver a speech at the Dallas Trademark. The speech concluded, We in this country are the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask that we may be worthy of our power, that we may achieve the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. President Kennedy's speech ended, The righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. For as it was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. This has been an American Minute with Bill Federer. For a free transcript, call American Minute at 1-888-USA-WORD. Standing up for faith, family, and freedom. You're listening to Rick Wiles. And now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. Now, welcome back to American Freedom News. Folks, this is uh, the People's Newscast. We're building another network to report the news because we can't trust NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, obviously. Uh, We can't trust the mainstream news media to tell us the truth. I think they're in on this election mess. Uh, anybody watching the electoral uh, retur- the the uh, election returns on Tuesday night, November seventh, knew it was as plain as anything that the that the news media was involved in some type of hanky panky. Something was going on, and it involved the state of Florida, and it involves the a network owned voter news service. Listen, I'm starting to think, and I've had this feeling since election night that uh, this entire election deadlock has been planned, that this is a, this is a, 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 a calculated strategy by the globalists to throw the United States of America into a state of chaos. And I, and I, and I'm, and I, I don't even think Gore and Bush themselves even know about it, even understand it. They're just pawns. They're just puppets as uh, uh, men with great power and wealth above them are manipulating the the events and 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 the, the the media pressure and the court decisions and we're we're being led into some type of constitutional crisis i think it's bizarre that we have a a presidential election that's 50-50 a us senate that's 50-50 and a us house that's 50-50 it's bizarre i just don't buy it i believe somebody rigged the election I believe this thing has been set up to put this country in a state of crisis. Remember? Remember the uh, the phrase on our money. Order out of chaos. It's the year 2000. And are the globalists, the Illuminati, the CFR, the Bilderberger gang, are they now ready to put the cornerstone down for this final plan that they've been working on for a long time, which is to move the United States into a global system of government. Are they going to bring a new order out of chaos? And then I think about Dmitry Dudeman's uh, visions that he saw saw Florida burning. Are we going to have this kind of chaos in the state of Florida? I'm telling you today, the reports I'm getting out of Florida show that 
tempers are getting extremely hot in the state of Florida. Now, you let this thing go on and on and on up towards Christmas, and there's no resolution of of the presidency. And and, and if the Electoral College deadlocks and throws uh, throws the whole thing to the Congress, the Congress will take take office, uh, I think, what is it, the first Monday in, in December? I think it's something like it's early December. Uh, the Electoral College meets December 18th. We've got Christmas. We've got New Year's in, in the middle of all this. Uh, the American people are not going to be ha- happy campers during this holiday. Uh, sales are going to go down. Uh, retailers are going to notice a depressed Christmas spending. Uh, the New Year's Eve parties are not going to be as lively. People are getting nervous about this stuff. Uh, the, the American people have been bottle-fed by the government and the news media and the establishment for the last 50 years. And suddenly they got to do a, 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 a quick uh, weaning off of the bottle because they're going to have to run the country. And the American people are not prepared for that. They're not prepared to take the constitutional leadership role of being the last voice the final voice in this country. They're used to being spoon-fed. They're, they're used to being bottle-fed. They want uh, the baby milk. They want to be told everything is all right. My check is coming on Friday. My Social Security check is coming next month. My Medicare is there. They want to know that everything is secure. And they do not like any type of insecurity or instability. And that is going to lead the public opinion to demand a a solution to this deadlock. If if this thing gets thrown into the Congress and the news media is there whipping up the the the, the public's uh, insecurity and telling the public it's it, this is really bad. The economy is now starting to go down. Uh, foreign powers are now wondering whether the United States has uh, its act together. The, the the feeling of instability is going to grow so great by the end of December, and then if they take it in to January, and now we're only days away from the inauguration of January 20th, and there is no president-elect, and the only person there is Bill Clinton and, and Senator Hillary Clinton. God forbid, look at what's happening to our country. Hillary Clinton's going to be in the U.S. Senate in December to help select the President of the United States. Uh, You can see where this thing's going, and the pressure is going to be so great on the public, and the the public is going to be demanding some type of solution. I I think it's going to get so nasty, so ugly, that neither Gore nor Bush could be safely put into office. I think we're going to be so split down the middle, so angry, so afraid at the ends of our nerves, both sides clashing, banging heads, that neither Gore or Bush could effectively become president. And I think Wall Street, the bankers, the globalists are going to begin to put the pressure on the Congress. Listen, we're in trouble. The economy is ready to go down. Our national security is in danger. Our respect around the world as the as the as the world's policeman is being ridiculed and being mocked. If we put Gore in, uh, the country's going to be divided. If we put uh, Bush in, the country's going to be divided. Everyone's going to say this guy was not elected. And so the pressure will be there to choose a Democrat and a Republican to serve as president and vice president. And who are they going to pick? It's got name a Democrat with the stature that would unite not only the Democratic Party, but make the American people feel good. My choice is Jay Rockefeller, and name a Republican that the country would accept. Colin Powell. I'll be back in a minute. Rick will be back in a few minutes with more global news headlines. Taking the spin out of the news, you're listening to Rick Wiles. This is Dr. John Wilkie with a Life Jewel. You've heard the term pre-embryo? It's used to refer to a living human from fertilization through his first two or three weeks of life. It is not a medical term. It's a political term 
thought up in the last decade by abortionists to dehumanize tiny humans. You see, an uninformed person hearing it is likely to get the impression that this is not human yet. The correct term to be used during these first weeks is embryo or living human embryo. And this applies from the first cell stage. What then truly is a pre-embryo? Well, it's many millions of eager sperm swimming after one ovum. When one sperm connects with that ovum, this is no longer a pre-embryo, this is an embryo. This is Dr. John Wilkie. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect news reporter in America. And now here's Rick Wiles. Welcome back to American Freedom News. Hey, if you want to be a part of what we're doing and help build this new news network, and I encourage you to write to American Freedom News, P.O. Box 459, Granbury, Texas, G-R-A-N-B-U-R-Y, State of Texas, zip is 76048. You can call us at area code 817-579-7557. Our web address, American freedomnews.com Again, the mailing address, American Freedom News, P.O. Box 459, Granbury, Texas, 76048. I appreciate all of you who are standing with us. Our bills are piling up. I sure could use some help to keep this newscast on the radio and on the Internet. Folks, we're going to have to unite as citizens, as patriots. Uh, we're being assaulted from every direction we got a church in Indianapolis that's ready to be taken away by the IRS. Uh, you've got uh, IRS raids being conducted all through this week. A number of patriotic organizations being raided by the IRS. Uh, they're putting the hammer down this week. And maybe we're getting uh, a taste of what the a new regime is going to be like coming into the White House. But I'm, I'm, I'm watching this stuff, and I don't like what I see happening. And, and and we we need to be praying and we need to be coming against this evil scheme that is trying to grab the power of this country. We've got a corrupt regime that is trying to hold on uh, to their illegal power in the White House. And this thing's got to be broken or we've got ourselves a an entrenched police state. Uh, in the last couple of minutes of the program, I want to tell you what's going on in Europe. I, I told you the other day that the European Union has officially established an all-European army. Now, Tony Blair for months has been denying that there is such an army coming. Uh, He was lying through his teeth. He knew it was coming. He just didn't want to take the heat in Great Britain. I've got articles from just a week ago where Tony Blair's cabinet was denying that England, Great Britain, was going to be part of any kind of European army. That was just one to two weeks ago. And yet this week... Tony Blair committed half of a Great Britain's Royal Navy to this new U- European military force. He committed, uh, right off the bat, 12,000 British troops. Uh, he made a pledge that up to 24,000 British troops would be committed to this Euro force over the next several years. He's given them tanks, guns, planes, soldiers. And we've got a 100,000-man European army suddenly coming together in the new Roman Empire. Uh, The London Guardian says uh, Britain threw its full weight behind the European Union's new defense effort yesterday, pledging 12,500 men for a rapid reaction force in the face of what government ministers dismissed as hysterical conservative warnings that the country's overstretched armed forces were being drawn into an anti-NATO morass. See, Tony Blair is Bill Clinton's friend. He doesn't have any problems lying to the British people. Folks, these people, these guys are socialist communists. They really are. They're, I mean, this third-way movement, are, it's, just a, it's just a hodgepodge of communist myth, misfits around the world. You've got the Clintons here in the United States. You've got Tony Blair in Great Britain. You've got Gerhard Schroeder in Germany. Uh, you've got uh, 
uh, you've got your Italian communists that are involved in this thing. The French president, uh, uh, Chirac, is a communist, socialist. These guys are, and then the guy running um, uh, uh, the one NATO organization, uh, what's his name, um, Javier Solano. I mean, he he is a well-known European communist, and he's in he's in one of the highest positions of NATO right now. These people are socialists and they're communists, and that's why they're not they don't have any problems lying to the people. And Tony Blair lied to the people of Great Britain and said, we're not going to join a European army. And then he turns around on Monday and he commits half of the military to this army. Oh, it, it has caused a, a, an uproar. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about Javier Solano. He's, uh, he's not, he used to run NATO. He is now the defense and foreign policy minister of the European Union. In other words, he, he's got a position like... Uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense of the European Union. But he used to run NATO. But he's, he's an old-time communist. And they're dismantling NATO. I, I, I've said before in the program, Bill Clinton's goal was to, to demolish NATO. Now, yesterday, Clinton pulled the rug out from underneath the, the, uh, our allies. I'm talking about conservatives in Great Britain. Who were, who, who were shouting, hey, this European army is going to compete with NATO. This is wrong. We've got to stop it. And thinking that the United States would back them up, well, they should have, been, they should have, should have known uh, that uh, Bill Clinton is, is a socialist with, with Tony Blair. And Madeleine Albright and the gang came out yesterday and said the United States fully supports this Euro- European army. And it's got the conservatives in Great Britain totally demoralized because they see this uh, uh, this uh, as as nothing more than than a, a sneak attack to to destroy the NATO alliance. Well, Mrs. Uh, Thatcher came out swinging yesterday. Uh, she uh, she called uh, Tony Blair uh, just about every name you can think of, and you know, and still do it uh, with a smile on her face as the British are are so well known for being so cordial and and uh, uh, diplomatic in the way that they, they slash and burn their opponents. The Guardian newspaper says former conservative Prime Minister uh, Thatcher has launched a fierce attack on the government over its decision to commit British troops to the new European Defense Force. Lady Thatcher interviewed last night uh, on the 10th anniversary of her departure as Prime Minister described the new European army as a monumental folly. She told the Sun newspaper, the government's plans to create a new European army uh, make no military sense at all. None to Britain, whose forces are already overstretched, and none to Europe, which has even less chance of becoming a military power than of creating a sound currency. And uh, William Hague, a leader of the Tories in Great Britain, is going to war with Tony Blair over this. Uh, uh, This thing, folks, Europe is rising up. That's the bottom line. A new Europe, a federal United States of Europe is rising up to power. And it's, whether you can see this or not, it's directly connected to the electoral college deadlock we've got in the United States. Because the people... At the top of this thing, I'm talking at the globalist level, they want to bring down the United States of America so Europe can rise to prominence. Pay attention to what's happening to our beloved country. I'll see you tomorrow on American Freedom News. You've been listening to American Freedom News with Rick Wiles. To contact Rick, write to American Freedom News, Post Office Box 459, Granbury, Texas, 76048. Call 817-578-3838. Visit us on the Internet at AmericanFreedomNews.com. Listen Monday through Friday to American Freedom News, news you'll never hear on television. Admit it.
to this Euro force over the next several years. He's given them tanks, guns, planes, soldiers. And we've got a 100,000-man European army suddenly coming together in the new Roman Empire. Uh, the London Guardian says uh, Britain threw its full weight behind the European Union's new defense effort yesterday, pledging 12,500 men for a rapid reaction force in the face of what government ministers dismissed as hysterical conservative warnings that the country's overstretched armed forces were being drawn into an anti-NATO morass. See, Tony Blair is Bill Clinton's friend. He doesn't have any problems lying to the British people. Folks, these people, these guys are socialist communists. They really are. They're, I mean, this third way movement, are, it's, just a, it's just a hodgepodge of communist myth, misfits around the world. You've got the Clintons here in the United States. You've got Tony Blair in Great Britain. You've got Gerhard Schroeder in Germany. Uh, you've, got, uh, uh, you've got your Italian communists that are involved in this thing. The French president, uh, uh, Chirac, is a communist, socialist. These guys are, and then the guy that uh, Bill Clinton is is a socialist with, with Tony Blair, and Madeleine Albright and the gang came out yesterday and said the United States fully supports this Euro European army. And it's got the conservatives in Great Britain totally demoralized because they see this uh, uh, this uh, as, as nothing more than, than a, a sneak attack to, to destroy the NATO alliance. Well, Mrs. Uh, Thatcher came out swinging yesterday. Uh, she uh, she called uh, Tony Blair uh, just about every name you can think of, and you know, and still do it uh, with a smile on her face, as the British are are so well known for being so cordial and and uh, uh, diplomatic in the way that they they slash and burn their opponents. The Guardian newspaper says former Conservative Prime Minister uh, Thatcher has launched a fierce attack on the government over its decision to commit British troops to the new European Defense Force. Lady Thatcher, interviewed last night uh, on the 10th anniversary of her departure as Prime Minister, described the new European army as a monumental folly. She told the Sun newspaper, the government's plans to create a new European army uh, make no military sense at all. None to Britain, whose forces are already overstretched, and none to Europe, and rising. And whenever you see T-bills rising, that's, uh, that's a sign that investors believe that the economy is going into a recession. They start pulling their money out of, uh, out of stocks and putting it into a safer T-bill investment. And that's been happening all this week, Monday, Tuesday, and now today. U.S. Treasuries rose for a third day, says Bloomberg this morning, bolstered by a Florida court ruling that's helping Al Gore win the presidency. But the big story is this. What if, what if Dick Cheney, God forbid, what if the man, uh, his health deteriorates uh, to the point that either the man passes away from a heart attack or, or he simply says, my doctors have told me the stress of this election uh, is going to kill me. I can't go on. Uh, I need to resign. I need to make way for another vice presidential candidate. Or on top of this, uh, he's he is dragged into court to prove that he is a Wyoming resident. And what if a federal court, a federal uh, court somewhere, uh, rules that, that Cheney is not a Wyoming resident, that he is, in fact, in fact, a Texas resident, and therefore he's barred by the Constitution of the United States from serving with Bush. What happens in the next uh, outside, beating on the door, shouting to let him in? The cops are there. Uh, this thing is getting ready to break out into fistfights. This has happened after the Supreme Court of Florida uh, last night made that uh, Democratic Party ruling, uh, allowing the Democrats to continue counting the votes until Al Gore can steal the election. Meanwhile, another uh, chaotic thing breaks out uh, this morning 
with Dick Cheney suffering heart pains and being hospitalized in a, in the, in a hospital in Washington. On top of this, there is a lawsuit in the state of Texas that is challenging Dick Cheney's residency in Wyoming. What in the world is going on? Well, I'm going to talk about it on today's program. I've, I've been trying to avoid devoting a lot of time on this program to the election because uh, you're getting this news from every other direction, every other radio and television program. Uh, but my friends, this thing truly is turning into a constitutional crisis. And I maintain that this, there is a reason to be concerned that this crisis is engineered. And I'm not saying that George Bush and Al Gore are doing it. I think they may be, uh, they may be puppets in this, in this game. And they don't even know who's totally demoralized because they see this uh, uh, this uh, as as nothing more than than a, a sneak attack to to destroy the NATO alliance. Well, Mrs. Uh, Thatcher came out swinging yesterday. Uh, she uh, she called uh, Tony Blair uh, just about every name you can think of, and you know, and still do it uh, with a smile on her face as the British are are so well known for being so cordial and and uh, uh, diplomatic in the way that they, they slash and burn their opponents. The Guardian newspaper says former conservative Prime Minister uh, Thatcher has launched a fierce attack on the government over its decision to commit British troops to the new European Defense Force. Lady Thatcher interviewed last night uh, on the 10th anniversary of her departure as Prime Minister described the new European army as a monumental folly. She told the Sun newspaper, the government's plans to create a new European army uh, make no military sense at all. None to Britain, whose forces are already overstretched, and none to Europe, which has even less chance of becoming a military power than of creating a sound currency. And uh, William Hague, a leader of the Tories in Great Britain, is going to war with Tony Blair over this, uh, uh, giving Al Gore more time to keep counting the votes. Cheney resigned as chairman of Halliburton Company, a Dallas-based oil services firm, after being selected as Bush's running mate. He was chief of staff during Gerald Ford's uh, term in office. He was also defense secretary during President George Bush's term. Now, here's the situation on his residency. We had a lawsuit filed here in, in uh, Dallas, and uh, which was uh, challenging Cheney's residency in Wyoming. Now, Cheney has a Texas driver's license, but he changed his voter registration to Teton, Teton County, uh, Wyoming, on July 21st, which was four days become, before becoming Bush's running mate. And I think it was the day before the deadline in Wyoming for voter registration. Well, the, the people who filed the lawsuit in Texas claim that, that uh, uh, Dick Cheney is not a Wyoming resident. He is, therefore, a Texas resident. And, therefore, because of the 12th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, he cannot serve as vice president under George Bush because both men are from the state of Texas. The Constitution bars the president and the vice president from being from 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 being elected from the same state. I mean, this this made this made newspaper stories all over the state of Maryland. And uh, I went to the courthouse and I asked them, "When are you going to count the absentee ballots?" No one would give me a straight answer. And when I finally got fed up with it, and I said, "Look, state law says you have to do this in the presence of witnesses, and I can be a witness." And then they finally. Uh, said, well, we're going to do it tonight at, 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 at 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. or whatever time it was. I also asked them to show me where the ballots were, were being stored. And a, an election clerk pointed across the room to a safe. This was a big, tall wall safe and said, over there. And I said, you mean that safe with the door hanging open? And, and she said, yes. And I said, those are the ballots right there in front of everybody, and she goes, yeah, and I said, why is the door open? And she said, because we're, 
we're coming in, we're taking the ballots and do it, you know, we're going here and back and forth with the ballots. And I said, wait a minute, why are you moving? Why are you moving absentee ballots? Well, she couldn't give me an answer. And so I called the sheriff and I, I demanded that the sheriff bring an armed deputy down to the courthouse and stand guard over the, the safe that had the absentee ballots and lock it up. And that made... I mean, I'm telling you, I made some enemies in my hometown when I did that because they knew I wasn't going to play games here with them. But here's what happened that night. Nice, tiny humans. You see, an uninformed person hearing it is likely to get the impression that this is not human yet. The correct term to be used during these first weeks is embryo or living human embryo. And this applies from the first cell stage. What then truly is a pre-embryo? Well, it's many millions of eager sperms swimming after one ovum. When one sperm connects with that ovum, this is no longer a pre-embryo, this is an embryo. This is Dr. John Wilkie. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect news reporter in America. And now here's Rick Wiles. Welcome back to American Freedom News. Hey, if you want to be a part of what we're doing and help build this new news network, and I encourage you to write to American Freedom News, P.O. Box 459, Granbury, Texas, G-R-A-N-B-U-R-Y, State of Texas, zip is 76048. You can call us at area code 817-579-7557. Our web address, AmericanFreedomNews.com. Again, the mailing address, American Freedom News, P.O. Box 459, Granbury. The government and the news media and the establishment for the last 50 years. And suddenly they got to do a, 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 a quick uh, weaning off of the bottle because they're going to have to run the country. And the American people are not prepared for that. They're not prepared to take the constitutional leadership role of being the last voice, the final voice in this country. They're used to being spoon-fed. They're, they're used to being bottle-fed. They want the, the baby milk. They want to be told everything is all right. My check is coming on Friday. My Social Security check is coming next month. My Medicare is there. They want to know that everything is secure, and they do not like any type of insecurity or instability. And that is going to lead the public opinion to demand a, a solution to this deadlock. If, if this thing gets thrown into the Congress and the news media is there whipping up the, 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 the public's uh, insecurity and telling the public it's, it, this is really bad, the economy is now starting to go down, uh, foreign powers are now wondering whether the United States has uh, its act together, the, the, the feeling of instability is going to grow so great by the end of December, and then if they take it in to January, and now we're only days away from the inauguration of January 20th, and there is no... Pre uh, his health deteriorates uh, to the point that either the man passes away from a heart attack or, or he simply says, my doctors have told me the stress of this election uh, is going to kill me. I can't go on. Uh, I need to resign I need to make way for another vice presidential candidate. Or on top of this, uh, he's he is dragged into court to prove that he is a Wyoming resident. And what if a federal court, a federal uh, court somewhere, uh, rules that that Cheney is not a Wyoming resident, that he is in fact in fact a Texas resident, and therefore he's barred by the Constitution of the United States from serving with Bush? What happens in the next? A uh, few weeks prior to the December 18th meeting of the Electoral College, what happens then if Cheney is taken out of this election? How's he replaced? Well, I, I did some quick research on this. And if, if a vice presidential candidate must be replaced, uh, the presidential candidate chooses a successor who must be ratified by his party before the December 18th meeting of the Electoral College. If it becomes necessary to replace Cheney as Bush's running mate, 
Bush would choose the successor on the ticket, then the grip the state since November 7th. Republican leaders are studying a 1948 federal statute that permits them to appoint a slate of electors if one of them has not been chosen through the normal election process. The article quotes Senator Locke Burt, member of the Florida State Judiciary Committee, saying what is under consideration is calling a special session, appointing a set of electors prior to December 12th. Senator Locke said Republican lawmakers were concerned that if the dispute over the one over who won the popular vote is not settled soon and no electors are chosen by the ballot uh, by the deadline to cast their vote in the electoral college, quote, it will result in disfranchising six million people in Florida who did vote. Well, the question is, what are the Democrats going to do if the legislature under Governor Jeb Bush just goes ahead and, and uh, uh, says, hey, the, the Florida election results have been tainted, and uh, we're going to go with the ruling of the, of the state secretary of state, Kathleen Harris, and we're going to certify those votes that George Bush won the election. So the question is, what are the Democrats going to do at that point? Obviously, they're going to, they're going to scream bloody murder. They're, they're going to go to, to the U.S. Supreme Court. And we're a wonderful, wonderful person. And I looked at my son, Jeremy, and I said, okay, let's go to the next room. The next nursing home room, uh, the dear old lady, uh, I would say she was probably in her 90s, uh, was an invalid. She was, she was uh, laying in a bed. She couldn't lift her head up. Her, her head was like laying down on her, on her chest. She had slobbers running down her face. Uh, she was a, you know, a stroke victim couldn't move uh, I I asked her uh, her name and she she made some grunting sounds um, you know I, it was obvious she was incoherent and yet I was standing there by her bed holding a an a Maryland absentee ballot uh, card with her signature on it now there was no no way this woman signed that ballot there was no way she couldn't even lift her eyelids to look at me let alone pick up a pen and sign a ballot and fill out a ballot. So who who did it? And and so we went we went from room to room in the nursing home and we went to multiple nursing homes and the story was the same. In each nursing home there was a nurse who filled out all of the ballots for the the patients of the nursing homes. Well folks, that added up into hundreds of votes and and I was losing by 10 votes. So it faith, family, and freedom. American Freedom News, the People's News Network. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the citizen reporter on the cutting edge of today's news. And now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. Republican uh, Congress member Lincoln Diaz Ballard, uh, whose district includes part of Miami Dade, said, quote, this is something, if it were not so tragic, if we were not witnessing, in effect, the stealing of a presidential election, it would be laughable. But nobody's laughing about it today. Uh, folks are beginning to realize that this is exactly what's going on, the stealing of of the election, and as I said on yesterday's program, I don't know why anybody would be surprised that uh, the Clinton-Gore gang would do this. We've had eight years of corruption. We've had eight years of murder, stealing, lying, uh, treason. What else have these people done? They they learned in. Um, I'll tell you what. When they when they got off the hook, when Clinton got off the hook on the impeachment over the Monica Lewinsky affair, when he got off the hook on that one, he, as the Wall Street Journal said in their editorial, that we have a coup d'etat taking place. These are strong words coming out of a, a newspaper like the Washington, like the New, or, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal, calling it a coup d'etat. And that's but it's exactly what's going on. Uh, the military votes... At, 
it does not look good that the military votes are going to be are going to be counted. Uh, uh, we've got some uh, military guys who are filing lawsuits claiming uh, that they were denied the opportunity to vote. A lot of a lot of military guys stationed in Florida, and a lot of military guys use Florida and Texas as their their address because uh, no state income tax in in Texas and Florida. There are reports that the day before election, a lot of troops were told, a lot of troops stationed in Florida were told to pack up and get on ships that they had to go immediately into various exercises. And those those troops were not given the time to vote. It was already after the, the deadline to apply for an absentee ballot. It's the day before the election. And so only God knows how many how many military men were prevented from voting. And only the commander-in-chief, William Jefferson Clinton, could engineer that kind of shenanigan to uh, surprise the Navy with a with security check is coming next month. My Medicare is there. They want to know that everything is secure. And they do not like any type of insecurity or instability. And that is going to lead the public opinion to demand... A, a solution to this deadlock. If if this thing gets thrown into the Congress, and the news media is there whipping up the the the, the public's uh, insecurity, and telling the public it's it, this is really bad. The economy is now starting to go down. Uh, foreign powers are now wondering whether the United States has uh, its act together. The, the the feeling of instability is going to grow so great by the end of December. And then if they take it in to January, and now we're only days away from the inauguration of January 20th, and there is no president-elect, and the only person there is Bill Clinton and, and Senator Hillary Clinton. God forbid, look at what's happening to our country. Hillary Clinton's going to be in the U.S. Senate in December to help select the President of the United States. Uh, You can see where this thing's going, and the pressure is going to be so great on the public, and the the public is going to be demanding some type of solution. I I think it's going to get so nasty. A lot of military guys stationed in Florida, and a lot of military guys use Florida and Texas as their their address because uh, no state income tax in, in Texas and Florida. There are reports that the day before election, a lot of troops were told, a lot of troops stationed in Florida were told to pack up and get on ships that they had to go immediately into various exercises. And those those troops were not given the time to vote. It was already after the, the deadline to apply for an absentee ballot. It's the day before the election. And so only God knows how many how many military men were prevented from voting. And only the commander-in-chief, William Jefferson Clinton, could engineer that kind of shenanigan to uh, surprise the Navy with, with uh, last-minute orders to pack up and ship out the day before the election. So what, we, what you and I don't know is how long Clinton and Gore have schemed and plotted, and they've got this long, long list of dirty tricks that they did, because if they could, if they could cheat, steal, and lie their way with a couple million extra votes, they know that that's all it takes to swing the election. And they had a long list of dirty tricks that they pulled, just like handing out the free cigarettes to the homeless people and getting them to fill out absentee.